Hey everyone, so uh, today we're going to be looking at roots and stems, but before we get into that, let us review. Okay, so in last lecture we looked at tissues, right, and we said initially that I don't have up here, but tissues, I should actually write it right here, so tissues are groups of cells, that have a collective function, All right? So we started looking at cells and now we're looking at groups of cells and we that these groups of cells, when they have a collective function, we refer to them as tissues. We said our plants have two main types of tissues, meristematic tissue and permanent tissue. And the big difference between them is that our meristematic tissue is made up of actively dividing cells. So that meristematic tissue creates other tissue types. Whereas our permanent tissue, uh, it, the cells are no longer dividing. So it is, the cells have differentiated. It is that tissue. It's not going to create new tissues. Now within our meristems or meristematic tissues, we have three main types and then another one that kind of tags along. So our apical meristems are found at the tips of our roots and our shoots, and they are responsible for primary growth, which is the lengthening of our plants. We also have the sub-apical meristem, which is like that one that, tag along, that tags along. That is more important in plants that form an initial basal rosette, and then later on will form a stem from which you will have flowers or flower infl inflorescence. When that flowering stem is growing, it often grows very quickly, and the sub-apical meristems uh, are active during that time. So this is a small region of cells right behind where you would find the apical meristem, and during that elongation growing of that flowering stem, they are this tissue is going to be actively dividing and creating more tissues to help speed up the growth of that stem. Uh, but again, those are really primarily important in these plants that form those basal rosettes. We have intercalary meristems, which are found in our grasses. And this is meristematic tissue that you find at nodes. So nodes are really um, where you will find the union or the joining of the stem and a leaf or a bud or a twig, as you can see right here, right? These points right here are nodes, and these this is the intercalary meristems that you find right there. Now, <coughs> the intercular, intercalary meristems are important in grasses because, as we said in the lecture, our grasses get grazed upon a lot, right? And as they get grazed upon, these regions of meristematic tissue allow for regrowth really quickly. Right, much more than if we just depended on apical meristems or dormant buds. So really important for our grasses that have evolved to be grazed upon. And then our last big meristematic tissue is our lateral meristems. And these are found only in dicots. And there are two types, the vascular cambium, which produces new xylem and new phloem tissue, and the cork cambium, which produces cork or bark tissue. And if we looked at this cross section right here, it's kind of a bad drawing, but here's the cross section of a stem. We have this right here, which would be our um, vascular cambium. And it's gonna produce new xylem, which we call secondary xylem interior to it, and new phloem, which we call secondary phloem exterior to it. And in this way, it is responsible for a secondary growth, which is the thickening of stems and roots. I should write that here, secondary growth. And like you can see here, it forms this cylinder right around. And then similarly, we have the cork cambium closer to the edge here, which is going to produce uh, bark material. So those are our meristems. Then we looked at permanent tissues, and we said there are two types of permanent tissues. There are simple permanent tissues, which are made up of one cell type, and there are complex permanent tissues, which are made up of multiple cell types. 
Now our simple tissues, there are three types. There's parenchyma, sclerenchyma, and cholenchyma. Kind of crazy names. Our parenchyma cells are our all-around cells. They're involved, they're found in all parts of the plant. They have multiple uses. A lot of times they're used for storage. They're also uh, used as photosynthetic cells. Like I said, all-around use. We have our sclerenchyma cells, which are uh, specialized for structural support and really in like the uh, regions of the plant that really require a lot of structural support. Um, they, the cell is dead in our sclerenchyma, in our mature scleren sclerenchyma tissue, right? Only the cell walls exist, that protoplast dies. And then we also have our cholenchyma tissue, which also provides structural support, um, but it's a little more flexible. The cells remain alive. Uh, it doesn't have this hard, rigid structure like our sclerenchyma does. And what um, the cell walls are a little bit different. Our sclerenchyma is, has lignin in it. That is a little harder molecule, whereas our cholenchyma gets hardened by extracellulose. We don't really, you know, guys don't really need to know that. Just know um, both are used for structural support, but cholenchyma is flexible, more flexible. And then we said we had complex permanent tissues. And these are made up of multiple cell types. And our two big complex uh, permanent tissues are xylem and phloem. Now the xylem transports water from the roots up to the rest of the plant. And our xylem is composed of vessels, tracheids, fibers, and parenchyma, four different cell types. Now our vessels are only found in angiosperms, remember our plants that produce flowers, and they essentially form a straw. Hold on, winds. They essentially form a straw, right? So they stack up on top of each other, and the ends of the cell walls dissolve and you have this big open straw. Our tracheids are found in angiosperms, but they're also found in gymnosperms. And they have the same function, but their cell walls don't dissolve. So they don't form this straw-like structure. Both our vessels and tracheids have pits in them that allow water to flow through the cells. The fibers are made up of sclerenchyma tissue and they help provide structural support and then our parenchyma cells provide some storage. Now our phloem tissue transports sugar uh, or photosynthesate, photosynthate primarily. And this can go both ways, right? Our xylem, it's a one-way road. The water comes from the roots up to the rest of the plant. Phloem can kind of go both directions. And our phloem is made up of sieve elements, companion cells. Our sieve elements are very rudimentary or they they don't contain uh, many membrane-bound organelles, so they have these cells, which we call companion cells, next to them that really carry out the metabolic processes for them. Our, uh, besides our sieve elements, they also, phloem is also composed of fibers, just like with our xylem to provide structural support, and parenchyma cells. Okay, so roots. Roots are important for a number of reasons. One of the first is that they are the organ which absorbs and conducts water and minerals from the soil throughout the rest of the plant. Right? They also anchor and support the plant. And in some plants, they act as storage organs. Think of sweet potatoes or carrots that you have there. Now, our roots typically make, <coughs> excuse me, make up about a third to a fourth of the dry weight of any plant. And most roots of woody plants extend only into the top meter of soil, so that top three feet. And you can see we have different types of root systems. As I kind of mentioned before, if we're looking at our dicots, typically they have one large tap root, and from that, secondary roots branch off. Whereas our monocots have more of a fibrous root system. So we are going to be looking at root development. And I think the easiest way to do that is to first look at anatomy. And then from there, talk about how those different parts of the root are actually formed. So we're going to start 
and we're going to look over here at our diagram of our root. And you see at the way tip of our root, we have a root cap. Now that root cap is what is going to protect the growing part of the root. Right, it's made up of cells, and these cells are going to get damaged as that root grows through the soil. And those cells are continuously replaced, and it's protecting the remainder of the root. Now, right behind the root cap, we have the apical meristem. And remember with our, with our lecture on tissues, that apical meristem is found on the tips of our roots and our shoots, and it's responsible for primary growth, the lengthening of our plant. This apical meristem is really important because it's essentially what is going to produce all the tissues in the root, at least initially. Right, and we'll get a little more into that. So moving on, if we're looking at a root here, on the outside of a root, we have what is called the epidermis. And that epidermis is a single layer of cells that protects the root, but it also, in our, in our roots, it, it creates these root hairs. Those root hairs are really important because they are the primary means by which water flows into the root. And actually, I think I have it here, right? So water and nutrients are entering the root primarily through these root hairs. So very, very important. Now moving inward. So our epidermis and our root hairs moving inward. This region right here is referred to as the cortex. Now our cortex is made up mainly of those parenchyma cells. Remember those are those all around cells. And here they're acting as storage cells, right? Storing different nutrients. Now there is an important layer of cells of the cortex in our root called the endodermis. You see it right here. And this endodermis is the most interior layer of the cortex and it separates the cortex from the central part of the root which is referred to as the steel and we'll talk about that in a second. But this endodermis is important because it is surrounded by a waterproof material called the Kasparian strip. And that is essentially that waterproof material prevents water and minerals from just diffusing through the root into the steel. Now within the steel, as I'm going to mention in a little bit, is that xylem tissue. And that xylem tissue, if you recall, transports water and minerals up from the root throughout the rest of the plant. Well, by having this uh, Kasparian strip right here, it prevents water from just diffusing in. So if water is going to get into our xylem, it has to go through cells. And in this way, it allows our plants to regulate the amount of water and the minerals that actually come into the plant. So it's a way that our plants are able to kind of regulate what they're taking in. And that is due to this endodermis and this Kasparian strip. Now, I mentioned just before the steel. The steel is the interior portion of our root right here. And we're going to go now and we'll kind of look at this top-down cross-section. So the steel is made up of a couple different tissues. We have the pericycle, which is the outermost layer of the steel. We have our vascular tissue, which is our xylem and our phloem tissue. And then if we are in our um, dicot roots, we have vascular cambia, which is going to produce secondary xylem and secondary phloem. So, if we're talking about the outer layer of our steel, we have our pericycle. And our pericycle is responsible for creating new branch roots. So we have, say this is our main radical, our main tap root, and we're going to have secondary roots branch off from them. Those secondary roots start forming from this pericycle right here, and they're eventually going to branch right off. Our xylem tissue we talked about before, our xylem is transporting water throughout the plant. Our phloem tissue is going to transport sugars throughout the plant. And then here in our dicot root, this region right here between our xylem and our phloem is our vascular cambium. And that's going to produce new xylem and new phloem tissue as these roots get thicker. You'll see there's a difference between our dicot root that you see here and our monocot root. In our monocot root, in our dicot root, you see that our vascular tissue is in the center, right? Our xylem, our phloem, vascular cambium. In our monocot root, the center of our root is pith. And pith, again, is just 
essentially parenchyma cells, again, as storage. And surrounding our pith are these vascular tissues. So surrounding our pith is xylem and phloem tissue. And here's phloem, xylem, phloem, xylem. What you don't have in your monocot root is this vascular cambium. This layer, which you can't really, it isn't really differentiated here, but it would be right here. That doesn't exist in our monocot roots because our monocot roots don't grow by that secondary growth. They don't get thicker in that way. So those are all the, that's the anatomical structure of our root. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I didn't. How does this develop? And to look at how it develops, I'm actually going to move and we're going to do a little drawing here. Okay, so as I said, all of these root tissues are derived from the apical meristem. Right, everything in that root. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to draw the root down here. All right, there's our root. Here's our root cap. And here is our apical meristem right there. All right, so everything is derived from this apical meristem. And like I said, we could start with that root cap. Now, our apical meristem also produces what is called protoderm. And that protoderm is eventually going to mature into the epidermis. Right, and that epidermis is that outer layer, it has the root hairs. Right, so here's our epidermis right here. Oops, yep. Darkness. Right. Our outer layer. Why does this not seem dark to me? And then we get the little root hairs, which are part of the epidermis. Now, a thing that you should realize when our roots are developing is that there are, they initially start out as these kind of more undifferentiated tissue. Right? So our apical meristem is producing tissues, it's producing cells. These cells initially go through a um, period of growth and elongation. We refer to that as this zone of elongation. And then after they go through this zone of elongation and the root is growing, they are going to mature and differentiate into their tissues, what they're going to be. So in the case of protoderm, it's going to turn into epidermis. And that is the zone of maturation. All right. So it starts off this apical meristem produces root cap. It produces protoderm. That protoderm those cells get bigger and then they eventually differentiate into epidermis, right? Now our apical meristem is also going to produce what we call ground meristem. It's another type of tissue that is going to mature into the cortex and a part of that cortex that really important part, endodermis. It's the important part that has, that is waterproof by that Kasparian strip, is the endodermis, that inner layer of the cortex. So again, if we're looking at our root here, we have the epidermis on the outside, and then this region right here would be the cortex. And the inner part right here is that endodermis. Okay. And then, lastly, our apical meristem is producing procambium. 
and from this procambium we're going to get everything in that steel, that inner part of the root, right? And that includes the paracycle. I don't know why this isn't writing that great right now. Paracycle, the primary xylem, primary phloem. If we are in our dicots, the vascular cambium. This is dicot. And if we are in our monocots, the pith. Right? So that's essentially how our roots are developing. It's all deriving from this apical meristem right here. Really, really important. It's creating all these tissues. It creates root cap, protoderm, ground meristem, procambium, and from each of those tissues, they fully mature and differentiate into further tissues, right? So protoderm becomes epidermis, ground meristem becomes this cortex and endodermis, and then if we're looking from the top down at our, our uh, root here, this is the steel inner portion, and the outer part is that paracycle, I spelled that wrong, hold on. So, you know, it's hard to write and talk. Paracycle, in our dicots, we then have our xylem in the middle, our phloem over here, our vascular cambium tissue between them. So this would be our dicot, and that is xylem, um, vascular vascular cambium. And in our monocot, we again have, here we have our paracycle, it's all the same. The difference is in the middle here we have something called pith, which is just more parenchyma cells. And then we have these, uh, our vascular system is arranged in this kind of cylinder of xylem and phloem. We have no vascular cambium. No, can't be up. That's our mono cut, right? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's a good way to think about it. Again, it, se it may seem like a lot, but if you get the understanding down, you get the anatomy down, the actual development isn't too difficult. It's all stems from that apical meristem, and it really is a couple main tissues that everything comes from. All right, so let's go back now. So those are our roots. Now, I thought it would be fun to show you a couple uh, interesting type of roots, right? So the uh, roots that aren't you typically find on your normal plants, right? So we have roots that are called epiphytes. Now they grow on the surface of another plant and these roots can contain chlorophyll for photosynthesis they will absorb moisture from the atmosphere rather than from the soil. So you'll typically find these in the tropics, right? Our orchids or epiphytes. We also have um, plants that have hemiepiphyte or hemiepiphytic might be the proper term, roots. So these begin as epiphytes, uh, but these roots eventually root into the soil. And a really kind of interesting one is this strangler fig that we're going to watch a video of right now. But some of these squatters can become murderers. 
young fig tree like this may arrive here as a seed carried by a bird. At first, it grows quite slowly. As it gains in strength, its roots crawl downwards over its landlord's branches. Some dangle free, but keep on growing. Eventually, they reach the ground. Now, supplied with nutrients from the soil, the fig grows really fast. The rootlets wrapped around the main trunk thicken and fuse into a lattice. tree's fate is now sealed, for it is in the clutches of a strangler fig. As years pass, the fig thickens its roots, embracing the trunk ever more completely. Trees grow by increasing their girth. For the host tree, that is now impossible. But growth is difficult anyway, because the fig has a huge crown in the canopy that cuts off sunshine from its host, and its roots in the ground are stealing most of the soil's nutrients. Eventually, the host tree is killed, and its trunk rots away. But the fig does not fall. Its roots now form a hollow cylinder that is quite capable of standing upright by itself. This strangler is about 300 years old. In fact, it may be misleading to refer to it as a single tree. It's probable that 300 years ago, there were several young figs up in the canopy. Now, centuries later, their roots have grown down to the ground. They've got rid of the body of their victim, and they're clinging to one another in this extraordinary interlace of pillars and buttresses in order to maintain their dominance of this part of the forest. Nor are these monsters always satisfied with just one victim. This 500-year-old, having strangled its first victim and lost its support, toppled sideways into a second, killed that, and then a third, and now its roots are ready to embrace a fourth. Dead tree trunks are not wasted. So the uh, video quality wasn't great, but I thought that was an interesting example of these kind of different types of roots. So we also have adventitious roots. Now this is really important. These are roots that form at any place on the plant other than the radical or its extensions. Right? So we all looked at germination, that radical is that main root. If you have a root that is going to form not from that radical or from a secondary or tertiary root, we call it an adventitious root. So these are roots that are forming from stems or leaves. We have a couple of really good examples and they have a number of different uses, right? So our adventitious roots can store food in the case of our sweet potatoes. They can provide mechanical support such as the brace or the prop roots that you see in corn. They can help you cling or climb or be parasitic, as you see over here with this daughter. Um, but adventitious roots are also the basis for propagation by cuttings. We'll go a little bit into propagation at the end of this course. Um, but essentially, for many plants, you can take cuttings of stem or leaf tissue and from that tissue, our plants will grow new roots. So those new roots that are growing are considered adventitious roots. Okay, so that is roots. We are now going to move on to stems.
The stems of our plants are the scaffold of the plants, right? They support the leaves and the flowers and the fruits. They can also um, photosynthesize. If we're talking about our herbaceous green stems, they will be able to photosynthesize and manufacture food that is then transported throughout the plant. Now, our stem development is very, very similar to our root development, right? With the exception, there's a few couple differences. Um, but again, here, if you look at the three tissues that are being produced, everything is being produced by that apical meristem again. And that apical meristem is producing three tissues, protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium, right? The same stuff that it produces in the root. With the exception is here, we don't have that root cap, right? We're, we're not burrowing through soil anymore. We don't need that extra protection. Now, our stem, the apical meristem, is producing this protoderm. And just like with our roots, that protoderm is going to mature into epidermis. And that is the outer layer of our stem. For our stems, this epidermis is often cutinized. So it's coated with cutin, which is a waxy polymer that's water repellent. And that's going to protect the plant from water loss. So there's our protoderm. Our meristem is also producing ground meristem, which is going to uh, mature into cortex tissue, right? Just similar with our root. Now, our cortex and our stem's a little bit different. In our root, it's primarily those parenchyma cells, those storage cells. In our stem, our ground meristem is made up of parenchyma, but also calenchyma and sclerenchyma because their stem is providing a little more support to the plant, right? And we also may have some secretory cells that do some other jobs, right? So as I mentioned, our parenchyma cells, these are all around cells, they'll act as storage. But if they have chloroplasts in them, they can photosynthesize and produce food for the plant. The calenchyma cells or the calenchyma tissue in our cortex is going to be in the outer layer. And remember, our calenchyma, they have thicker cell walls that have more cellulose in them, and they're going to add structural support to the stem. Our sclerenchyma tissues are going to provide even more structural support, and they'll be more important, uh, particularly in more of some of our woody species. Their cell walls have lignin, which is a tougher fibrous tissue. And those secretory cells will produce resinous substances that help protect the plant from different insects and pathogens, and it's commonly found in a lot of our pine trees. Think of the thick resin that you can find in pines. So that's ground meristem, right? We have our apical meristem, the tip of our stem is producing three tissues, protoderm, epidermis, ground meristems turning into the cortex, and oh, actually, I have cork cambium on there as well. I'll show that in the next one. But some of the cortex, the outer layer, becomes this cork cambium tissue that's also important for producing the outer layer of bark or the cork tissue. And then we have our procambium. And just like with our roots, our procambium is producing primary phloem, primary xylem, vascular cambium, if we're talking about dicots, and pith. So we're going to look at some examples here, and I'll go a little more uh, in depth. Right, so here are our woody perennials, uh, our trees, our gymnosperms, our dicot angiosperms. If we're looking at the outer layer, we have the periderm, which is uh, this outer cork layer that here has been produced by this cork cambium. And like I said, this cork cambium is a layer, outer layer of our cortex. Um, it is going to continually produce new cork tissue, which is just new outer layer bark tissue, All right? This could also very well be a epidermis at the end here, but as this plant, it could have started out as epidermis, as this cork cambium started producing, producing cork, it's going to destroy that epidermis, and it just replaces it with new cork tissue. Uh, so that is um, the... Uh, outer layer here, our cortex includes the, um, this kind of, cortex is kind of this layer right before you start get to the uh, phloem tissue, which begins right here. So here's like a zoomed in pie slice of our larger thing. So you have our, your cortex right here, your phloem, which is included as part of the bark of the tree. And again, that phloem is produced by the procambium. It produces the phloem. 
the xylem and the vascular cambium. But what's interesting here is as your trees grow, it produces these rings, right? And these rings that you see here are really rings of xylem. And that is new xylem that's produced. And we refer to it as secondary xylem and secondary phloem that's also produced. So you have your vascular cambium right here. That is this ring that you see right here. And each year it's going to start producing new xylem tissue this way and new phloem tissue this way. As it produces that, it is uh, crushing the primary xylem and phloem that was created by the apical meristem. So it's producing this new xylem tissue and new phloem tissue. And that xylem tissue is what we refer to as our wood in our woody species. It, you might have heard things such as summer wood and spring wood, and this is related to how these layers are produced in the spring, our plants are growing faster, and what happens is these vesicles, these vessels or tracheids of our xylem tissue are a little bit bigger as a result, so you get a little different type of wood than later on in the summer, something to be aware of. But essentially that's what ha is happening as our tree is growing and, growing, and this is all that secondary growth the thickening of our plant. This is how our tree trunks are getting thicker. Now in our herbaceous dicots, they're going to look a little bit different. However, it's a similar structure, right? Here, and we actually have it here as well. I didn't mention it, but in the interior here, this is the pith tissue. In our herbaceous dicots, that pith is larger. So all that interior is pith. Instead of having a nice ring, of tissue, it's a little more separated into these vascular bundles, and these vascular bundles contain xylem and phloem, and running between them is the vascular cambium, right? So it's it's a little bit, it's arranged a little bit differently, but the idea is the same, right? You have your epidermis at the outside of your herbaceous dicot, and then you have your cortex, which is your will consist of your parenchyma cells and your cholenchyma cells which are that calenchyma is providing a little more structural support. And then you have your interior here, and you have these vascular bundles that on the outside consist of phloem, on the inside consist of xylem, and running between them is vascular cambium. And as this, this plant grows, and it goes through secondary growth, it gets thicker. It is, it is getting thicker because this vascular cambium is producing new xylem, or secondary xylem, and secondary phloem and that's how it's going to get thicker. Right? Got it? An example is tomatoes, potatoes, our herbaceous dicots. Now, our monocots are different. The big thing with our monocots is they don't have that vascular cambium, right? So they don't undergo secondary growth, at least not in this way, that our dicots do. So if you look at our monocot stem, you don't see that ring of vascular tissue. You don't see a ring of vascular cambium because it doesn't exist. Instead, our vascular bundles, our xylem and our phloem, are kind of scattered around the stem. But you still have your epidermis. You have your ground tissue, which would be your cortex and your pith tissue as well. But it's not arranged in such a cylindrical pattern as you see here in your dicots. Now, I mentioned um, that our monocots don't go through secondary growth, at least not in the way that dicots do. Uh, but some monocots do get thicker. Their stems get thicker. And how is this happening if they don't have that vascular cambium? Well, as some examples of monocots that do get thicker are dates and our coconut palms, right? They, they obviously get a thicker trunk. What's happening here is that the parenchyma cells are actually enlarging and dividing. Now, when I first talked about parenchyma, I said that it is classified as a permanent tissue and those cells are no longer dividing. There is a caveat, right? So when we are talking about certain monocots, those parenchyma cells will continue to divide to thicken the stem. Additionally, if our plants get injured, those parenchyma cells can divide to regrow tissue. So they're not entirely dormant or permanent, but for the most part they are. So here's a little caveat where those parenchyma cells are still dividing, and this is the way that our monocots get thicker.
Now we have a couple of interesting stem forms, right? Uh, we have rhizomes, which are underground stems that grow horizontally. That's a cattail uh, that I have up there. That You should recognize that from the edible plant um, lab. Right, so rhizomes are underground stems. They grow horizontally, and they're used for... The plant uses them as a way to propagate itself vegetatively, right? So it grows these underground stems, and then from different nodes on those stems, we have roots that will grow, a new shoot will eventually grow up, and we can... The plant can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Stolons, similar idea, except these stems are uh, growing horizontally above the ground. And if example would be your strawberry plant right here. Right, so instead of this being underground with a rhizome, our stolons are above the ground. We have corms, which is a type of thickened, compressed stem that grows underground, and this is utilized as a storage organ, right? And so it's going to help our plants survive the winter. Bulbs, very similar to corms, right? They're also this underground storage organ, such as our onions are there. Um, the difference between them is how they're constructed. Our bulbs are these layers of modified leaves that we call scales. It's a little bit different with our corms. Tubers, potatoes, are also underground stems. They're not actual roots. Um, but they function as storage organs like a storage root as well, right? Fleshy underground stems that are going to allow these plants to survive the winter. All right, so that is it for roots and stems. Um, in the next lecture, when I go through the overview of this, I'll go over the development of both again. Again, it's not incredibly complex. There's a couple of um, tissues that you need to be aware of, but once you get the patterning down, it's very similar between your roots and your stems. There's a couple little differences with the root cap, with um, some of the tissues that make up the cortex in each, and then some differences that you see between monocots and dicots. But um, once you get that, that patterning down, you guys will have this down, no problem. All right, that is it for this lecture. I will see you guys with the next one.